Uh, my name is Allison Feeder. I'm a graduate student in Dmitry Petrov's lab at Stanford, and I'm going to be telling you today about some of the work I've done during my thesis. So I'm interested in how large natural populations adapt. So during my PhD, I focused on HIV, which is a master of adaptation. In this talk, I'm going to tell you two short vignettes. First, I'm going to tell you how better drugs have fundamentally changed the way that HIV evolves drug resistance within the body, and what that means about interpreting treatment failures. Second, I'm going to tell you how HIV is structured into different anatomical compartments within the body, and what this means for interpreting intrapatient data. Now, it's hard to study HIV drug resistance evolution until the late 80s because we didn't have any HIV drugs. The first drug, EZT, was introduced in 1987, and it failed quickly and predictably because of single nucleotide mutations that rendered the virus resistant. Far from being a rare occurrence, this happened in nearly all patients in just six months. So how is it possible that HIV evolution is so fast and so predictable? Well, it helps to think about what's going on inside of the body. Each virus has a probability mu of acquiring drug resistance, which means the, po the population of NE viruses has probability any mu. And this rate is critical because it tells us how long the population must wait before a beneficial mutation arrives. And here, in this uh, toy example, the population has to wait approximately 100 generations. Um, and when this beneficial mutation arises and establishes, it spreads in the classical signature of a hard selective sweep. But this isn't a good picture for HIV for multiple reasons. And one of them is that the effective population size, the population mutation rate, is, effect is uh, expected to be much higher, closer to one. What this means is that a beneficial mutation might enter the population every single generation. Therefore, when one beneficial mutation emerges and begins to spread, another occurs elsewhere, and together these, pop these mutations sweep in the population. This is what we call a soft selective sweep. So to just sum up, when the population mutation rate is high, we might expect a short waiting time between beneficial mutations, and therefore a higher probability of evolution within a fixed time interval. When sweeps happen, they should be soft. On the other hand, when there's a low population mutation rate, we might expect to see a long waiting time between beneficial mutations, and therefore a, a lower probability of evolution within a fixed period of time. When sweeps do happen, they should be hard. So looking back at this, uh, this picture one more time, we might expect that in the 1980s, when drug resistance evolution was fast and predictable, it was likely driven by soft sweep dynamics within hosts. Now, if we zoom forward uh, to, to where we are today, Drug resistance evolution has gone way down, and this is partially because we treat patients with combinations of multiple different drugs simultaneously. So what these better drugs may have done is lowered the effective population mutation rate in terms of producing adaptive solutions to the complex tasks that is asked of viruses uh, by treating them with multiple drugs simultaneously. If this is the case, then when patients fail, uh, they should fail via hard sweeps that are associated with long waiting times between beneficial mutations. Now, this needn't be the case. It's also possible that these mutations represent, a, or these patients represent a biologically or behaviorally or virologically distinct subset of patients in which the dynamics still look very much like they did in the 80s. Maybe these patients aren't taking their drugs properly. If that's the case, then we might expect the failure to dynamics to look very similar to how they did um, or how we might assume they looked previously. So what I want to know is when modern drug treatments fail, do they fail deterministically, as would be marked by soft sweeps, or do they fail only after long waiting times for beneficial mutations, as would be marked by hard sweeps? And we can look for these signatures of hard and soft sweeps in data to try to get at this question. So luckily for us, hard and soft sweeps leave different genetic signatures in data. So in a hard sweep, a beneficial mutation happens on only one background which means that when it spreads, it, uh, all of the associated variants hitchhike to higher frequency. Thus, we might expect a large decrease in diversity associated with a hard sweep. On the other hand, in the case of a soft sweep, you have beneficial mutations landing on multiple different genetic backgrounds, which all hitchhike to intermediate frequency. Therefore, uh, when a, a population fixes a, a drug resistance mutation via a soft sweep, we might expect the population diversity to be much less strongly affected. So what I'm going to do is look within treatment categories and ask, for a specific, uh, for a specific treatment, with, do patients with more drug resistance mutations tend to have a lower genetic diversity as compared to patients with fewer drug resistance mutations? And we can look across treatments from across the epidemic and ask whether there's a signature in one direction or the other, with the assumption being that if there's a large decrease in diversity, this should be associated with hard sweeps. So now what I'm showing you, or what I'm going to show you, is just sort of the change in diversity associated with a drug resistance mutation, that's DRM. So uh, this is essentially the slope of the line that we were looking at on the last slide. 
And I'm gonna, and on the y axis or on the x axis, we have treatment efficacy as measured by the proportion of patients that fail th treatment after, or they are not virologically suppressed after 48 weeks. Sorry, they are virologically suppressed after 48 weeks. And I'm going to start by showing you a treatment that doesn't work very well. And because it fails across a lot of patients, we might expect that it also fails frequently within patients in the form of soft sweeps. So what we see is that indeed, this, uh, this mutation is actually, or this treatment is actually above the line, suggesting that there's actually a slight increase in diversity associated with fixing a drug resistance mutation on this treatment. Now I'm going to show you the rest of the data. So if patients failing on good therapies were predestined to fail because of adherence or other reasons, then we might expect that they're going to be up here. On the other hand, if patients are failing because uh, they, you know, they're just unlucky patients and they've happened to wait a, a relatively short time among a longer distribution uh, for their beneficial mutation, we might expect them to be down here. And what we see is this. Better drugs are associated with harder sweeps of drug resistance evolution in HIV. And this pattern is uh, significant, even accounting for these high outliers. So what the uh, further, if we color these different uh, points, these different treatments by year, we can see that the most modern therapies are associated with the very hardest sweep, the biggest decreases in diversity. So what this suggests to us is that these better drugs have changed the way in which HIV evolves drug resistance within people. In the early treatments that failed often, it seemed to be driven by soft sweeps, but now it looks like it's driven by hard sweeps. So although this doesn't help us necessarily stop more patients from becoming drug resistant, it does start help us move along on the path of understanding why some patients continue to fail. So this is kind of the first part of my talk, and um, the second part of my talk is really going to try to dive deeper into that question. So this still leaves the question, how patients acquire drug resistance mutations or how HIV populations acquire drug resistance mutations when they're treated with three drugs. So the idea behind this is that even if a virus gets one drug resistance mutation, it shouldn't be able to spread because two other drugs are suppressing it. Yet in HIV, we still do see occasional sweeps of single drug resistance mutations. So people have tried to think about how to explain this. And one theory or one hypothesis that people have come up with is that HIV isn't one big population, but rather it's split into several subpopulations within the body that are interconnected by some amount of migration. Then, if not every single drug gets to every compartment equally, then you can have places where there's spatial monotherapy, which might allow single drug resistance mutations to spread locally in some places. Now, this is not a hypothesis I'm actually going to be able to address today, but what I am going to talk about is one of the assumptions that this model sits upon, which is that the HIV population inside of a patient is not one well-mixed population. So we are not the first people to wonder about this question. Here's a subsample of studies from the past several decades, and what the results that they found have been mixed. <laughs> so we're left with not only trying to understand why HIV or how HIV Look, whether HIV looks well mixed, but also how do we explain all of these variable results? What is going on here? And we think that one thing that might be causing this is the fact that HIV is changing dynamically and quickly within a patient. We know this. So perhaps maybe this fast, this rapidly changing population is also driving fast changes in compartmentalization as well. So to look at this pattern not only in space but also over time, I should mention that most of these studies only sampled at a single time point. So we're particularly interested in looking at data where we can look at things both across space and across time. So we've done this in a macaque model where we have a macaque infected with RT-SHIV, which is an SIV with an HIV reverse transcriptase spliced in. This means you can treat SHIV with, an, with HIV drugs and it gets the exact same types of mutations that HIV does. So we allowed a uh, shiv to establish within this macaque, and then we treat it with a, treated it with a monotherapy, which initially succeeded but ultimately failed in suppressing the viral population. We sampled this throughout the time, uh, the course of the infection, and from several different tissues within the macaque. And what we're attempting to ask is, can this data show us how drug resistance emerges within these macaques, both over space and over time? So to start, I'm going to show you a Mueller diagram about what this looks like in the blood plasma. So on the x-axis, we have time, and on the y-axis, we have the frequency of different linked genetic backgrounds. So we see that initially the population is mostly wild type, but it's quickly overtaken by uh, multiple different drug resistance mutations on linked backgrounds. So as is completely consistent with the first half of our talk, in response to this monotherapy, drug resistance has evolved via a soft sweep. Uh, the other thing we notice here is that drug resistance takes over really quickly, suggesting that selection is very strong as well. But what's really cool is now we can start looking at these patterns across different tissues. And what we see is this. So multiple, uh, the same exact variants indicated by the same colors are spreading across compartments. 
um, suggesting that migration is a fast force in this system. However, not all, of these com not all of these genotypes are doing exactly the same thing in each of these compartments, suggesting that perhaps migration has an upper limit. It's not infinitely strong. So we see that depending on the time of, of sampling, there's more or less evidence for compartmentalization. But I'm going to have to refer you to the paper for more details on how we determine that. But this rapidly changing compartmentalization got us thinking that maybe a very high migration rate, coupled with very strong selection, might be able to explain some of the patterns from our literature review. And so to get a sense for what types of parameters could create these patterns, I just explored a simple island model under strong migration and selection. And what we observe is, so essentially what we have are two populations interconnected by a certain amount of migration, M. So a proportion M migrates per generation. And each population starts with their own beneficial allele, which is increasing in frequency um, due to selection S. So quickly, each population also gets a non-local variant that arises, that uh, arrives in the population via migration. And so we can look at the frequencies of the non-local and local variants and ask what this can help us learn about uh, compartmentalization. We can describe these relationships with a differential equation that has two main components. So migration forces the allele frequencies closer together, the local and non-local allele. And then selection increases all of the derived variance relative to the wild type. And by solving this differential equation, we can begin to explore its dynamics. So I'm just going to show you the results for one particular set of parameters. We see that initially the local, invariant, uh, local variant increases rapidly, and the non-local variant slowly invades. And because we have closed form differential equations, we can also translate these allele frequencies into FST, which is a measure of population differentiation. And we see that FST is also changing dynamically throughout this time course. So if you were to assay this population at this point, you would say FST is very high, compartmentalization is prevalent, migration must be low. But if you were to sample here or here, you would come to exactly the opposite conclusion, despite the fact that migration is constant across this entire time. So if we look at this across a wider variety of parameters, we see that the relationship between migration and selection is important in determining what the shape of population differentiation looks like over time. But these diverse patterns suggested to us that maybe in temporal data, we could use these, these types of shifts in time to estimate the relative strengths of migration and selection in data. So this is what we tried to do with our shift data. I used a modified version of my model, uh, but now it has finite population sizes and uh, mutation. And what we're going to do is simulate trajectories under, these, under this model and see what input parameters produce data that looks most like the data that we've observed in SHIV. Um, and we're going to use approximate Bayesian computation in order to do those fits. So I'm going to start by showing you pairwise comparisons between groups of compartments and starting with the plasma and the gut. And what we see is that the, the selection strength that we estimate is quite strong between 1 and 10. And we see something similar for the plasma and the lymph node. This is telling us that um, this is strong, but it also kind of makes sense with the, the rapid increase that we saw in our trajectories. For the population mutation rate, we get estimates between 0.1 and 1. This also makes some sense to us because this is the sort of regime where, um, where soft sweep should be prevalent. Where it gets really interesting, though, is when thinking about migration probabilities. So here is the, the, our estimate for the plasma versus the gut, and here's the plasma versus the lymph node. And what we're seeing is clear evidence that there's more migration connecting the lymph node and the plasma than the gut and the plasma. Because we know that the lymphatic and circulatory systems are very interconnected, whereas the gut is mucosal tissue and may be doing something else, this makes some sense to us biologically. One other cool thing about this is that when we back calculate NE from this population mutation rate and plot NEM equals 1 here, what we can see is that we're estimating migration rates that are far above what we would expect to be able to do with neutral alleles under equilibrium. So this is by watching a process that's really rapid and dynamic in time, we're able to get a sense of these parameters that are much stronger than what we can do with just simply neutral markers. So um, to kind of wrap this up, does this help us explain what we're seeing in this, this uh, slide here? So perhaps it does. So if these different studies are, are sampling essentially the same adaptive process in time, or at slightly different times, perhaps they're reaching different, different conclusions about how important compartmentalization is in this process. Further, if we stratify these things based on the compartments that are being compared, we see that this also helps clarify the picture. This also makes sense to us in the context of seeing uh, different migration rates estimated between different parts of the body. So what I really want to want to say here is that this intrapatient adaptive process leaves these heterogeneous patterns in space and in time. And we really need a thorough understanding of how all of these parameters interact when they're strong in order to be able to interpret these patterns. OK, so to tell you what I've told you, um, <laughs> first, uh, 
I've shown you the better drugs have hopefully, I've hopefully shown you the better drugs have changed how HIV evolves drug resistance inside patients, and the treatment failures nowadays are at least in part uh, driven due to bad luck. In the second part of the talk, I hope I convinced you that the intrapatient evolutionary process is dynamic in space and time, and that all of the parameters, N, S, M, U, seem to be strong and important. Um, so for a long time in population genetics, it's, it's very easy to think about these forces as being weak, but um, I think that there's a, a definite need for trying to understand what happens when all of these things are jointly strong. So with that, I want to wrap up and thank my collaborators. Um, I've had fantastic collaborators on this project, particularly my thesis advisor, Dmitry Petrov, um, and my, I'm currently funded by Stanford SEG, and I am extremely happy to take any questions. Thanks for listening.